Energy Science of Living Buildings, hosted by Dan Winter, bioarchitects.net. Biologic Architecture Principles and Real Application, Juan Schlosser, biarch.co. Integrating bioarchitectural small budget dwellings in natural environments. Alosha Lenov, bioveda.co. Followed by a panel featuring Michael Rice, zem.design. ConsciousEarthAlliance.com I'm so glad to be here, and I'm so glad to introduce this section, which is on eco-biologic architecture. As they said, the physics of housing is really about the science of what makes a building alive and what makes space alive. And we've been pioneering that for many years. Actually, my main function here today is to introduce our guests, who first will be Juan Schlosser, who I've known for many years, and then an exciting guest named Alosha from South Africa and Russia, and you'll hear more about that. <clears throat> As I do this intro, which I'm very pleased to do of Juan Schlosser's work, bioarch.co, I wanted to give a short introduction to how we've been pioneering biologic architecture as science, actually as electrical engineering for many years. And we've made great progress and our curriculum in biologic architecture is now being used in many countries. As Amar beautifully said, uh, I really appreciated Amar talking about natural buildings. And I really loved Helena's talk earlier about eco-community and villages. It was fabulous. But the point here about, as Amar was saying about, if the building was made of soil, for example, you felt like you were in a womb. Well, we're able to teach that using science so clearly that you can actually measure whether a building is going to make a seed germinate. And that's the point that now that we know the, the electrical field theory, the actual physics of what makes a building alive, we can teach biologic architecture as a profound and important science and make sacred space and the, the, the space that gives life measurable. As we say, we decide which architect gets a paycheck by measuring whether that building will cause a seed and your child to grow. <laughs> and beautifully, Juan Schlosser, whom I'm introducing here, has pioneered our measurement technology. So you can see the background of our biologic architecture work for many years at goldenmean.info slash architecture. And you'll see we held the world's biggest international conferences in three continents on biologic architecture, including university in Mexico City. Now we've launched that into a global network of biologic architects, bioarchitects Dot net, and you'll find Juan Schlosser there as well. In addition, you'll find Michael Rice there, who is a wonderful biologic architect from Ireland and now Europe, who is the person who recommended Alosha. And Michael Rice is also a fabulous shaman. So you see that an introduction to a real global network of biologic architects and living space, living life force in buildings is so important. I mean, basically, if your building is steel and aluminum electrosmog and bad air, then your aura is not going to grow, and that ain't spiritual. <laughs> and so we're teaching that as a science, that at a university level, you can actually teach what biological architecture is. And I'm going to do another two minutes on that subject, and then turn this over to Juan, who you'll see has beautiful slides. So the, the, I just want to explain the core science, and let me see if I can do this in one minute flat. Supposing you were wondering, what is the difference between a live seed and a dead seed? And supposing you were electrically oriented, I've been an electrical engineer all my life. So how does an electrical person define the difference between a live seed and a dead seed? Well, obviously, in a live seed is going to be able to suck in that first nutrient. And that first suction effect actually is quite literally charge implosion. So that really sucks, doesn't it? No, I mean, <laughs> but you get the physics. So electrically, that charge implosion, which creates suction towards center, turns out to be the definition of life, not just in a seed, but also in your brain, for example. If your electric field is centripetal, the focused human attention causes charge to compress. That's called charge implosion. That's the basis of my life work, and it's a fractalfield.com. Point being in, if you want to apply that to architecture, we now know that we can measure 
in advance when the architect is done, whether that building will cause a seed or a, charge, a child to grow. And that measurement is we take a, a brainwave sensor and I pioneered this uh, thanks to Phil Callahan many years ago. And you'll see our measurement technology at flameinmind.com slash life force. And essentially a brainwave sensing device, if we wet these sensors just a little bit and place that next to a tree or inside Juan Schlosser's bamboo construction, he's gonna show you the measurements. And what happens is capacitive coupling will measure up to one millionth of a volt as a wave shape, a weak charge field inside that building. And then we take a spectrum analysis, a harmonic signature and measure the frequencies. And that will tell us if that weak electric field is imploding and therefore alive and therefore sacred. And Juan Schlosser helped us to actually do that in buildings defining the difference between his beautiful bamboo biologic structures and steel and metal buildings and proving you could predict in advance which biologic architecture was going to cause a seed to grow, defining sacred space and the availability of bliss. And by the way, Juan Schlosser also, his pioneer, he's very scientifically competent. He's actually done work measuring and developing the implosion technique in water vortex that actually makes charge from a vortex, which is actually what you need to do in sacred space and during bliss. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Juan Schlosser, bioarc.co. And Juan, you have about a half hour and we're looking forward to your pictures too. Go take it away, Juan. Awesome, thank you very much, Dan. Thank you so much. I love your work, you know, I follow you for so many years and it's an honor for me to be here tonight and, and do this presentation. And uh, as, as Dan say, well, I'm not really a technical guy. Um, uh, I, I love the science, I follow uh, this, you know, I, re I read stuff and books and listen to all sorts of lectures and really try to educate myself about all of this stuff. But my my intention really with, with knowing the science is really being able to apply it, right? To apply it into design. And that's what I, what I really focus most of my time uh, doing. Um, in any scenario, I think because of my particular point of perspective, being, being not a technical guy, I'd like to explain a little bit the science that Dan talks about um, and also the main principles. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to be very simple here. So we want to reach a lot of people so everybody can, even the non-technical -te people, the non-scientific minds can really understand some of these principles. Uh, it's not easy, but it's not necessarily too complex. Uh, but, you know, um, I think this is, this is very, very important um, because uh, also, this has to do with, uh, Amar, I think, was talking about, like, you know, there is a lot of building regulations in, in the architectural world. And as an architect, we go through a lot of, uh, we go through a lot of, um, um, you know, you, you got to pass building codes in order to build something. But interesting and surprisingly, a lot of the science that, that we are talking about here in bioarchitecture is not contemplated in any building code. Uh, so I wish that at some point in the future, these things that we are presenting here uh, and that Dan has been talking about for many years will at some point actually be in, you know, like people will have to actually prove that, um, that, that you know, that buildings actually have to follow this kind of energetic principles in order for them to be uh, regulated uh, and passed through code. So anyway, I'm gonna jump into, sharing my screen and I'm going to start to show some, some slides here. Um, all right, one second. Okay. Okay, so the title of the presentation is Biologic Architecture Science and Real Application. Um, So let's talk about two main fundamental principles. I call these the three keys to bioenergetic design. And there are two principles that we need to understand in, in order to comprehend how a building acts as a capacitor in order to harvest this dielectric, uh, electrostatic potential that exists in between the ionosphere and the surface of the earth, which is which is called the Schumann frequency. So 
that's one of the these three keys really is what what defines how a building uh, will be considered a healthy environment for you to live in. There are many other considerations, but I believe as bioarchitects, these are the three keys. These are the three fundamental notions that we need to comprehend in order to create buildings that are actually able to, uh, to qualify as bioarchitecture. So let's say um, their frequency, uh, let's define what, it, what is their frequency, also called the Schumann frequency by the scientists who discovered it. So uh, these are a series of uh, resonances. It's not, it's not only one frequency, but um, you know, um, a series of resonances as well, uh, apart from the, the key frequency. So this frequency is actually generated in the cavity that exists in between the Earth surface and the ionosphere. So that's a resonant cavity that has a specific frequency and have a series of harmonics. And that's what we call the, the Schumann frequency. Uh, so they are extremely low frequency in range, which is called ELF, which is uh, extremely low frequency. So these frequencies, as Philip Callahan discovered and as Dan continue um, you know, that research further and, and, and really develop to, to a whole another level, these, these frequencies are um, are essentially harvested by, by, by ecosystems, by trees. So Philip, Philip Callahan was able to measure these frequencies in the weak electric field of trees, but also they can be harvested by structures and buildings. And that's what's happened. They can be harvested or in, in another scenario, like mo most of modern buildings, they actually bleed these capacitance and you cannot measure the Schumann harmonics in, in most of modern buildings. Um, and the presence of that frequency, the Schumann harmonics is actually very beneficial for health. That's something that, that we know. Um, so Philip Callahan, uh, which was the, fir the first scientist who really came, up, came across this principle, explains how trees and forests are a type of dielectric antenna. Uh, so they are a dielectric antenna that tap into the Schumann harmonics at a very, at very low frequency, ELF. Um, so he discovered uh, that when you measure the, the weak electric field of the tree, you will find that you can measure the Schumann harmonics out of the living tree. But in the other hand, if the tree was actually not, not healthy, the Schumann harmonics were not present in the weak electric field of the tree. So you can actually, you could actually use this as a form of diagnosis of the health of a tree. And virtually you could uh, measure the healthy of an entire ecosystem, I believe. Um, so the question is really how we extend this to our structures, the buildings we create and design, because they also have to act as a dielectric antenna, antennas to harvest uh, and, and dielectrically coupled to the Schumann harmonic cascade. Um, so the, one we could we yeah. could mention that the harmonic geometry of that cascade we now know actually fits the equation for implosion. So the reason Gaia is negentropic is the same re reason a tree is because it knows the music of implosion. So if we do our buildings for that, <laughs> then we have a big mm. uh, go, go ahead, go ahead, Juan. Beautiful, that, very nice comment. Um, so let's say so. Uh, this also connects to what you are saying because life is negentropic. So why the Schumann frequency is so important to biology? What, what's happened, for example, to astronauts when they go to space, they have to carry this Schumann frequency generator with them because otherwise their health will start to fall apart because they need that negentropy in order to be healthy. And this has been, this has been proven you know, in experiments with the, when the Schumann uh, um, frequency was discovered. If you insulate a, a human being in, in a Faraday cage and they are completely insulated from the Schumann harmonics, they are they become in sick. They, they start to feel the press. Their entire biology starts to fall apart. And so this is a fact. So what's happening in modern buildings is like people is, they are not completely insulated, but they are, they are depraved to 
to many to to many to, to a big extent of these harmonics this is why health begin to to deteriorate in, in people who who live in in modern structures you know many floors above the, the ground uh, surrounded by steel which completely builds the capacitance etc cetera, etc cetera. so um another interesting um concept here is that uh, that really demonstrates why the Schumann harmonics uh, and the earth frequency is so important is the work of Lou Montagnier, uh, which basically is he was working with DNA uh, replication. So he, he finds out that when you play this frequency, suddenly the DNA spontaneously generates in water. So I found that like, you know, his experiments have a lot of, um, you know, they, they, they want to, there is much more conclusions that we can take out of his experiments. But one is that the Schumann frequency is so fundamental for DNA replication. And this is one of the reasons why when you are absent of it, your, your, DNA, your, your cells are constantly replicating and regenerating. So if the Schumann frequency is not there, you will experience some trouble and some health issues, obviously. So that's just another interesting um, clue. And, that and we, we actually, have, we actually have measurements now that the Schumann cascade in plasma, like verified.net, will cause a plant or a seed to actually revert to a pre-genetically engineered state. So we can actually prove uh, going backward in time toward increased order, the definition of neg entropy. So that implosion is all present in the Schumann music. Yeah. So, and, and Juan puts that into his buildings. <laughs> There we go. The, the, the buildings are able to generate a weak electric field, which is very much what the Therafy is creating, right? Um, so, and, and this this really leads us to another concept here: is the materiality, the materials. Like, uh, why materials are so important to create buildings that are actually able to to sustain this capacitive field? Uh, in most of cases, dielectric materials. Um, are the most optimal to create structures and not metals. Why? Because we need to understand what is a capacitor, right? So a capacitor is an electrical device that stores an electrical charge. Uh, that charge inside of the, capac the capacitor is called capacitance, okay? So essentially what a building is, is the dielectric is a dielectric material that is sitting in between the surface of the earth, which is negatively charged, and the atmosphere, which is positively charged. So any material or any object that sits in between that electrical potential is a, by definition a dielectric uh, and is acting as a capacitor, but is essentially a very large capacitor and a very complex capacitor. That's why Philip Callahan got, called this as well dielectric antennas because they are they are dielectric in nature, and they Maybe exhibit capacitance. Be... Yeah, I was just going to say just uh, thirty seconds on what dielectric means. It just means how efficient is charge distributed inside the material. So if there's a high dielectric material, then the, char the capacitance of charge moves around inside very efficiently. It literally rings like a bell. So that's why natural biologic material have high dielectric constant. And so that's why your aura breathes inside a, a clay building like uh, Amar was saying. Go ahead, Juan. Yeah, that, that, um, that uh, the electric constant is a very interesting, very important term to actually understand for, for, for people. It's just what you describe, like, uh, the electric constant is the permeability of a material in being able to concentrate electric flux. So it's permeability in the same way that, you know, something is permeable. It's like the, the electric flux is able to permeate that material, to go through it. Uh, and there is, you know, many people understand more the concept of coils, for example. So if you have a coil um, and you put an iron core, which is something ferromagnetic, you increase the magnetic field in, and that, that iron core has a, a very strong magnetic permeability. So here is the same concept. When you have a dielectric material, 
if you if the dielectric uh, material have a very very um, very good uh, dielectric constant, then that increase the electric flux density of the capacitor, which is basically the building. So the 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 more natural your materials are, because naturally by definition, natural materials are produced to exhibit high dielectric constants. Uh, the more the electric flux will be able to, your building will be able to sustain. And that will be very beneficial for life. That will be very beneficial for, for uh, storing the, the Schumann harmonics, which are so, so, um, so, uh, you know, so beneficial for our health, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it, it's beautiful. And just, just to say that, you know, dielectric concept just means charge is distributed so efficiently. If you, you can make a phase conjugate mirror if you have high dielectric constant. That's how you make time reversal and make entropy first time. And by the way, high dielectric constant is how the ancestors made ancestor phone calls in obsidian mirrors. And it's the physics of alchemy. So studying high dielectric material materials that breathe charge beautifully like the lithium niobate when scotty says beam me up scotty <laughs> the warp generators is all about high dielectric so it's a beautiful thing to study right that, that's really bring us the the notion of sacred space and why many many ancient buildings uh, and sacred structures were built using this high dielectric materials because that's where they could have these profound spiritual experiences where they were able to connect to that uh, collective mind and and uh, and you know and, and also have Kundalini experiences and and, and peak experiences of, of all different types. So buildings should be able to not just provide health but also to to lead you to that to that kind of uh, uh, deep spiritual experiences. Uh, exactly. And that's really sacred the function space. of sacred space, right? Yes. Um, exactly. So, so yeah, fra fractal, fractal antennas, complex antenna designs, fractal antennas are what trees are. And buildings also should be designed in such way, which that, that's what the whole biomimicry, energetic biomimicry, uh, that's a, a concept I like to, to talk about. It's really mimicking nature in the way nature creates fractality in order to to generate these dielectric fields, which are so beneficial for life and for spirituality as well. Um, and then I like to bring something up as well. The, princip the principle, which we really have to do with shape energy, which is the concept of the resonators, dielectric resonators. So in electronics, we have uh, something called dielectric resonators, which are basically cavity like structures made of ceramics, interestingly, that where the, the waves get confined inside of these res resonators, they bind back and forth and they, they amplify it, right? They, um, they, they ampl amplify these frequencies. So these resonators can be tuned. That's exactly how it's done in electronics, right? So you have the micro to the, to the macro, which is a building. You, you, you do it in electronics. It works in a very electronic device. It's what all our electronics are, are using, but you know, these physics are also applied to buildings uh, and buildings can act as the resonators, can amplify specific frequencies and can enhance these energies even further to create a very beautiful healing effects and, and, and generate a sacred space and, and you know, and, and produce all these beautiful um, um, energetic effects that that we would like to generate in, in bioarchitecture so you have about uh, 10 to 15 minutes you're about halfway through so go ahead one go if, ahead 15 minutes Beautiful. okay yeah i have so many slides man i, I think yeah I that's right keep, keep rolling really, but, <laughs> okay um so many 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 ancient cultures really understood these principles of subtle energy uh in relationship to form etc uh, you know like like we know uh, human human made antennas which cover the planet similarly capitalizing the properties of geometric shapes so Pro professor philip callahan actually spoke about this where he says religious structures throughout throughout the ancient world um were finely tuned dielectric antennas which collected energy from the sun the earth and the cosmos and then pass it into the meditators religious practitioners and 
the environment around the structures of these temple structures. So now, now we're going to talk about what Bill, Philip Callahan did basically was like, and uh, we already talked about it, but he was um, essentially measuring the field effect of trees uh, with his rate, because he, he was a radio, um, he was working with radio, right? So he had radio amplifiers and a spectrum analysis. So he, he took his, his, um, his um, probe and then he put it into, an, into a tree and he measured the uh, harmonics. So he, he find out that the hair harmonics were present in trees only when they were healthy. Uh, so he has this intuition uh, that probably buildings will be doing the same thing. So he knew this village in England where people were living a very long time, over a hundred years, right? So they, they, he went to, to this village and he spectrum analyzed the structures in which these people were living. These structures were made of earth and hemp, interestingly, and uh, he, you know, voila, the, the, the Schumann harmonics were there. So he basically proved for the first time that structures are able to act like trees and, um, and leverage and the Schumann harmonics to produce this healing and, and life enhancing effects. So can we replicate these studies today? Yes, Dan Winter and uh, have created this um, functional app, which is basically an EG headset, like he showed before, which measures uh, um, the weak electric field of the, of the brain. So in the same way that you can measure a weak electric field, which is a brain wave, you can also measure a weak electric field um, inside of, a, of, a, of a, an architectural environment and inside of a structure, because that's exactly what it is. It's a weak electric field that, um, that is present in the environment. Uh, so this, and I, when I use it, and I, you know, we were doing this, this uh, work together, I was basically helping them to put together this, to do the, the, the beta testing of the software. So we essentially put together 80 pages document where we measure uh, six conventional buildings and four by architectural environments. And then we cross reference as well this with the GDB, we did, um, we did um, a measurement of electric field, magnetic field, um, radiation field, and we also did uh, biogeometry, so using pendulums. And we collected the results and we put together this whole document, uh, which I think was a, an amazing piece of work and very interesting to actually uh, put it together. It's um, beautiful. And we're eternally grateful for your help, Juan. It was great. It's all at, was, and Juan's website or our website, goldenmean.info says architecture. Go ahead, Juan, please keep going, keep going. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a beautiful work. So, here I want to show something. This is actually uh, me measuring a tree uh, in one of my projects in Shambhala project, which was a remote island in Indonesia. There was no electric grid here. Uh, the closest place where there were any, anything was like you know many kilometers away. There was uh, an island in the middle of the ocean. So I went with the um, um, the muse and the and the flame in the mind, and I, I put the muse into this tree. And I measure one of the most cleanest environments without electromagnetic pollution that I ever, because I was doing all this work before. Uh, this was af after it, right? So I, I realized how how pristine energetically and uh, is this the you know, an environment like that like that is. And you can see these are this can't be uh, electromagnetic radiation coming from anything because there wasn't really an electric grid. So each one of those peaks is the breathing electric field, weak electric field coming out of the tree. And you can see how spot on all the, all the harmonics of the Schumann frequency the, are in Yeah, the, the, uh, the known Schumann harmonics are in blue. The measured frequencies there are in white. And you can see that cascade effect. So the, the tree is singing to Schumann, it's gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, it's, this measurement is absolutely gorgeous. I, I love it. And then, Okay, this, so this is, this is just a uh, few slides of that document, a big document. I can present the whole thing because there is way too many, but, uh, 
measurements, but this is the most relevant. So this is the first house that we measure. That was just a standard concrete architecture uh, structure that, uh, you know, that, that we found uh, just a friend that, that was living in that house. And this is sort of the bottom line. So this is the GDV. You can see the graph there with uh, the measurements. And this is the Schumann harmonics in there, which there's a lots of noise. Then we have the seed germination and that you can see the, the, the side of those seeds. Then we went to another concrete house and then we took the measurement. Same thing, you can see the seed growth, uh, the GDB is pretty much the same energy levels. Um, and it's still quite noisy. And then here we go into one of our structures. So this is a bamboo structure, a dome. Uh, and you can see how the seeds actually started to grow quite a bit more and the GDB is actually measuring quite a bit more of energy in, in that space. Uh, and the Schumann harmonics are, are present there. And unfortunately, it's very hard to take these measurements because there is a lots of noise in most of spaces. Uh, so the most, the way we were able to take really true measurements is where we were a little bit, structures that were a little bit far from, from electrical grids, etc. cetera. Um, this is then our last um, measurement, which is uh, the office, the new Earth development office that we have next next to here, which is actually, you can see the incredible difference in the GDB measurement, how much those graphs are actually in comparison with the first concrete structure. There's way more energy in everywhere. You can see this, the seed germination really um, made a lots of difference of how it grow you can see a lot more presence of the Schumann harmonics. In this slide, we can see also uh, all of them together, the five more relevant measurements, and you can see how uh, the difference in between the seed germination and the weight, like the sizes in between the, the, the office where the seeds were germinating are like substantially different. Uh, so these are some of the effects that we're able to, to measure. So as Juan um, mentioned, that the one house was actually concrete, which had probably metal rebar. So when you see the difference, you can almost double your seed growth by simply making a structure out of natural material and measure and predict in advance what buildings are going to cause a seed to grow. That is a breakthrough. Every university architect should be taught this. Yeah, absolutely. It should def definitely be taught in the curriculums of universities, but unfortunately, nobody is really talking about this. Uh, We're starting that this here. <laughs> Starts now. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Uh, how, how long more I have? How Maybe long five, more I have? Five, five, five more minutes, unfortunately. Five or six. Oh, please. Okay. Please. Go, just go. Uh, oh, okay, I keep going. Uh, this is another slide. I, I love the work of Jerry Tennant. And I think what, you know, what we were looking at about all of these slides talking about, you know, electric fields. So why electric fields are so beneficial to life? I think Jerry Tennant has a lots of insights of why this is so important. One of the reasons is because the cellular voltage of our cells in, in a healthy state should have around minus 25 millivolts. If that voltage, voltage changes, that equals disease. It's as simple as that. So the root cause of most of the diseases have to do with electrical voltage, including cancer. Uh, so, and particularly, especially also when you're, you, you are healing, when you're trying to heal, your, your body goes in minus 50 or, or even more. And if your, your body cannot produce that electrical voltage, then you can actually, you can, that's where chronic disease occur. That's where chronic pain occur. Uh, and this is, as I mentioned, the root cause of most diseases really has to do with cellular voltage. And interestingly- and Jerry, Jerry's book is called Healing His Voltage. And he actually visited us here in France and discussed this. It was wonderful. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. Oh, amazing. Yeah, I, I love his work. It's very, very relevant to Me this too. conversation. And um, well, I don't know if I'm going to have time, but one, one of the very interesting things that also he elucidates is that many times also uh, an electrical dis dysfunction in the cells has to do with a store emotion in the cellular memory that basically manifests itself as a magnetic field. So there's a magnetic field that is a, a trauma or an emotional 
um, you know, it's, it's, it's basically if you will measure, and he's able to measure one of one of the device, one of the devices that he developed. He's able to measure these magnetic fields are in the body, and what's happened to magnetic fields and electrical fields is that they are inversely proportional. So if you have an electric field and you put a very strong magnetic field next to it, you will that that electric field will diminish. So that's what compromises the electrical voltage, and what what creates the root of the disease in the first place. So he explains this, this beautifully. And one of the reasons I mentioned this as well, Dan, and I think is very interesting is because we actually are using a lot of steel in buildings, iron, and iron by, by, by iron augments the magnetic fields. So that will decrease the electrical voltage of your body on its on itself. And I think that's is, this is really, um, really interesting to mention. Uh, and this is this is here. This is um, uh, this is from a, a documentary called Geopathic Stress. And actually, I send this to every one of my clients because it's a very instructive documentary about uh, geopathic stress and 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 how it works and how to prevent it. So you got you have these pictures here of how you have you have an electrical field. The electrical field is one hundred and fifty four. You put a magnet, it goes down to ninety nine. Right, the same thing happens as uh, Ken Wheeler demonstrates. Uh, if you have a cathode ray cube and you stick a magnet, you 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 destroy that electric field. So that's exactly what happens in the body, and why your your body cannot sustain that electric field, and why it leads to disease. Uh, this is also part of the documentary. So you can see how they measure magnetic lines. So you have these two guys. This documentary is, is brilliant and it really explains a lot of things. So uh, one of these guys is a scientist, the other one is a dowser. So they actually corroborate their, their work. One measures with dowsing, the other one just have a, a, a sensitive magnetometer that is able to, What's to measure those that? magnetic lines. What's the title of that it's documentary? A geopathic Geopathic stress documentary. You can find it in YouTube as yeah. geopathic, geopathic stress. stress. Documentary. And we should explain that steel, because the iron has been heated, is what destroys that dielectric constant. We're almost out of time, but please, a few more pictures of your beautiful buildings here. Yes. Okay, let me let me run very quickly. So I just kind of probably jump. Uh, so this also is in the documentary. They show this house that whatever it was designed with uh, the materials, the proportions, the the forms. This house, this house actually, when they were measuring this, these uh, lines, they were actually, they will disappear as they will approach the house. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they were investigating about this, this building and they find out that the lady actually that was living in this house, she was actually living for over a hundred years, um, mm -hmm. which is very interesting. So, and then there's this polarity in between the magnetic materials and paramagnetic materials. It's, it's not that the ones are good and the other ones are bad, but we need to use them in certain way when we design architecture in order to to leverage the properties and that's that's very important to really understand how to uh how to design by architecture uh i like to show this i mean this slide also talking about iron like we don't realize when we are inside of a building because we don't see the steel but you can you can see those yeah. just, just like how much steel and that, that's what is short, inside of most of these mi that's what shorting out microstructures your, it's, it's, that's what's shorting out your electric field exactly um Juan, maybe just show a few more pictures but maybe during that um rada wants to ask a question i think but keep more pictures while we're doing it okay, okay. see the, Oh, yes, yeah, uh, Juan, no, narrate that one about the water jet. That's gorgeous. That, I, I the love this. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. I love this because uh, I'm, that, that's also what's, what's happening in the, the Kelvin generator. So you have, when you have water in movement, uh, the water is able to create an electrical charge that then accumulates in this in these uh, capacitors, and then they electric polarize, and then they are able to produce like a really high uh, high voltage discharge up to like uh, you know uh, uh, ten kilovolts. So most of people don't realize how much energy actually water is producing, and that's also it's, it's how it's piezoelectric in the atmosphere. 
Yeah. It's piezoelectric water, as Schauberger demonstrated, and it's literally a vortex of implosion. So the vortex of implosion in water is exactly what a vortex of implosion in an electric field is, same principle. Uh, and Juan did some pioneering work on that and Schauberger's work, and we're out of time, but <laughs> a few more slides. We're out of time, okay. okay. Well, okay, let me go very quickly. Anyway, this is very interesting. I found these images in, in Instagram, but basically I'm showing like how a, a, a sacred structure in Thailand, a temple is actually, uh, you know, probably they saturated the dielectric uh, um, charge right. and then it started to actually um, sap the clouds, uh, discharge <laughs> it on the, on the top. And if you, you actually notice that picture is taken in the sunset. It's actually yeah. a sunset, an Agni Hotra moment. And that's why it's probably saturating that dielectricity. Yeah, because um, it's longitudinal embedding there. It's gorgeous. <laughs> Good work, Juan. This is, this is also very interesting. It's a Corona, Corona motor electrostatic motor. Uh, the, the, the motor is connected to the ground, and then the, basically this is an antenna that goes up with a drone about 100 meters, and you can see the motor running. So that's it's just atmospheric electricity. That's a, another way to look at it. You can go on YouTube and, and watch many of these videos, and, and that's how so many ancient temples were just basically using that principle to, lab, to, to, to harvest this, this dielectric discharges that, that we are talking about. And, and anyway, so do um, Juan's, Juan's buildings. But Juan, I think we have to introduce our next speaker. That okay, Eric okay. Is gorgeous work. okay. Well, we need to give Juan a, a more time next time, but you can contact Juan at bioarc.co. Look at the building work he's been doing. It's incredible. We just didn't have time here. But Juan, okay. I, I, you're my hero, Juan, really. Oh, you're my hero as well. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me tonight. And it was a <laughs> to pleasure. Be I think... To be continued. And let's share this and people to to invite you to contact you, bioarc.co. Um, and so hopefully maybe we'll have some time for questions later. We'll see. But now we, do, we should introduce our next speaker. OK. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much, Juan. Really fabulous. Let's see if we have time for questions later. So. Um, I now have the privilege of introducing Elosha. And uh, how this came about was um, we were looking to have another speaker here. We talked to Michael Rice, and Michael Rice recommended Elosha, who's really quite famous in his own right. He's been working with our old friend uh, Michael Tellinger in South Africa, uh, designing. Uh, eco villages, eco community, natural spaces, and then he's pioneered how to turn a, a Russian village into an eco space for pennies on the dollar. And uh, he's really got that youth and enthusiasm to make this happen. So um, let's see. I think uh, now, if uh, Aloshe, if you want to share your screen, yeah, and yeah, I'll do that. Maybe um, Juan, if you want to stop screen sharing, yes. And Alosha, you're on. Thank you for being here. Okay, can you see my screen share? I already yes. stopped the screen share, I believe. Is it? So this beautiful, this. Okay. Uh, oh, there we go. Can Great. You see it? Yes, yes, it's gorgeous. Okay, hi Dan, hi guys, um, thank you, Michael, for bringing me onto the show. <clears throat> my inspiration with sacred geometry actually started with. Michael Rice um, in 2006, when I saw his Fibonacci spiral mirrored like this white lines you see behind the drawing. And then I started to see various shapes with tracing paper um, and I drew them out with pencil. And at the time I was um, reading uh, Vic Victor Schauberger book and very much inspired by, <clears throat> let me just see. Okay, here we go. So yeah, basically designing a whole bunch of shapes from um, sacred geometrical um, patterns. Um, and uh, Mike, um, Victor Schauberger inspired me to see water patterns and uh, how water moves in, in vortices. So um, this drawing on the top left, <laughs> you can see uh, a little kudu horn uh, the bottom there imploder. So I started going on to the whole implosion and uh, uh, I met Dan Winter through his website at the time and, and saw all the work that he was been doing with sacred geometry. And basically the drawings took me to start just developing little homes that have these uh, technologies built into them. And also I have attended a biogeometry workshop with Ibrahim Karim 
And that inspired me to create uh, some sort of uh, mixed up between all, all mixed up organite and biogeometry uh, antennas on top of our buildings that could uh, do all those amazing things that <laughs> Juan just spoke of. Um, also got inspiration to, I, I'm, a, I'm an inventor, so it was from clothing that could stop electromagnetic radiation with certain uh, magnets and stones and biogeometry placed at uh, certain chakra points and places on your outfit. And, uh, you know, but my love for uh, geometry started actually back in uh, 2000 when I um, uh, just finished school and basically my mom said, okay, son, it's time to go get a job. And I couldn't, <laughs> I worked for one day and then I decided that to hell with it. So I started basically making decorations out of ultraviolet wool and uh, polystyrene balls. Um, for clubs and trans parties. And, and then I, it, it turned into fabric, spandex. So with spandex, I tried to make the rooms curvilinear because I just found that all, all the spaces are so square and uninhabitable. You know, our bodies are so liquid and organic and so is nature. Um, and suddenly we're all living in these boxes. So, you know, where, uh, spandex was a good uh, way for me to break through um, into, you know, decorating spaces. Uh, and then after an introduction to Michael Rice and all that geometry, I designed my first uh, ferrocement roof, which was, it's just a design. Um, and <clears throat> then after that, I traveled to the first ferrocement workshop in 2007. Okay, move this fast. So with with the dog, I'll get to first mentor, but basically with the my Van Deco business, a prototype, uh, the geodesic domes, which of course are um, filled with uh, sacred geometry, the pentagon, the hexagon, and um, started experimenting with these buildings in more in an event and exhibition space, and then I attended my first ferrous cement workshop in in uh, Mexico with Steve Kochler, and. Um, I know you guys have been talking about steel and rebar, but the stuff that you make out of it is amazing. And we don't have bamboo growing in Russia. So, you know, I do have to find alternatives because I definitely feel that natural materials are way to go. But ferro cement is just uh, extraordinary materials. So coming back to South Africa, excuse me, how's my voice done? Can you hear me? I know there's a bit of an echo here. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you well, I think. Well, maybe okay. I raised a little bit of volume, but uh, go ahead. If you okay. maybe. So, yeah, so coming back to South Africa, of course, uh, uh, starting small. So I created a little uh, dog kennel washing machine, and then I took a, a, a full scale 11 by six and a half meter ferro cement seashell roof. Um, on my farm, then I moved out to the farm because I couldn't stay in the city any longer. I thought that. Uh, um, you know, the land is going to heal me, <laughs> which it didn't, but uh, more about it later. So I would sink a geodesic sphere underground preparing for 2012. I had a bit of a prefer mentality at the time, and it has a dream catcher strung in it. So me and my family could sit underground when the earth moved um, in the sphere. So here she is. Um, and then I was creating in these geodesic domes very much Um, you know, and, and have clean water coming out for use of or the toilets and the vegetable growing. So, you know, very much inspired by sacred geometry, I decided to create a mandala garden and I, I burned my fingers really bad because if you try and create a mandala garden on a hill, um, it's a really a disaster because the bottom beds being the C-shape, you know, they catch the water, but the top beds, uh, the garden beds, uh, which, you know, divert the water <laughs> and suddenly you have a desert and, you know, go big or go home was one of my uh, psychological programs that I acquired from my father. So I made this half a hectare organic garden and um, triple, double dug it 60 centimeters deep. And the next thing, um, because I didn't follow permaculture principles of contour, contour line design, half of my garden washed away in the rain um, to the bedrock. Um, 
so I started playing with at the same time with uh, Super Adobe bags and attended a Cal Earth workshop and built this little uh, home, uh, which I already used the, uh, the little entrance windows here. They're all pay, uh, facing north, uh, east, uh, all the different directions. So you basically have a sunlight that comes in and on the opposite wall, you make a, a marking so you can, the sun actually tells you when uh, the uh, winter, um, so uh, winter, yeah, like summer solstice and winter equinoxes are, um, autumn equinoxes are. So you have basically different times of the year that get marked out by this calendar with these round windows. Um, then I got inspired by, you know, went and <laughs> visited Mike Reynolds in Taos and uh, just got blown by his uh, architecture that uh, fully autonomous buildings uh, that, um, you know, harvest, uh, provide electricity and fully off the grid. And at the same time, I've attended a Cal Earth workshop and learned about uh, the vaulting and uh, domes and arches, which was very inspirational. Um, I mean, like here at Cal Earth, we saw how a building gets designed, like these benches, by looking at the shade that gets casted on, on the floor from the building behind it. So it's a series of domes and the shade that they cast on the floor, actually they use that to mark out these benches. So I know we can have ideas on paper how things should be, but in reality, um, we should, um, you know, listen to and be, be, get inspiration from, from nature. And that's why it's important to, to, to sometimes get off paper and get on the land because there are different ideas that, that come to mind when you're doing something in practice versus uh, conceptualizing it on paper. And, and of course, wetlands, uh, water has been my big thing because without water, you know, we, we can't move anywhere. So of course, treatment of water, that's Mike Reynolds drawing and I started creating wetlands um, to treat gray water and pool water. That's my other mentor, John Todd, um, which was able to treat radioactive waste through these clear containers and um, allow the water to, you know, basically go through different containers. And it was really, really toxic chemical waste from factories. Uh, so the first tank would have different plants to the second tank and they would be inoculated with the same uh, healthy um, ecosystems like ponds and lakes and marshes, but they'll be inoculated four times a year, four different seasons um, and with the same material, but the first tank would grow different uh, plants and, and, uh, and algae that could take the harshest chemicals and the second tank would change and, and so on. So the plants rearrange themselves to what they can handle. Um, of course, very important to keep in mind that besides pretty designs, being in Russia, um, you know, we need to consider things like the law of thermodynamics. So an ideal wall uh, would be have a certain amount of mass and a good amount of insulation because then the mass can uh, store the heat throughout, uh, collect the heat throughout summer and release it slowly in winter time. And this drawing is again from Mike Reynolds. Um, and of course, the movement of the sun is very important because this is what I tend to, um, I wasn't doing when I started with the all sacred geometrical drawings because I just made it this mandala homes that had no relation to the sun or, or the wind. And um, the earthship was a perfect opportunity to, a perfect example to see how that all works. As you can see in, in summer, the, the, the sun is, um, you know, the overhang is shading the, the room and in the winter, that sunlight comes through into the room. So, um, you know, the designs of our buildings besides sacred geometrical need to reflect uh, um, and adapt to exactly where we are in the world and the angles of the sun, the, the water flows, like some of you guys may want to have a house that's buried. We have a water uh, level, um, water table, like two feet below or even a foot below ground <laughs> in springtime. So if I have a house that's buried, it's, uh, you know, I'd be walking in, in water all day long and I'd have, uh, you know, mold problems constantly. So again, adapting to your environment. Here's a workshop I attended with Mike Reynolds in Malawi, where we built a sacred geometrical flower, petal with eight flowers. Um, then very much inspired by, um, this new technology that's coming out, it's a plugin for rhinoceros. So I'm, I wanna bring in technology and natural building into one cohesive um, ecosystem. So here's a, a program called Rhino Vault, 
which basically you set a, a, a parameters where the entrances are, where the structure lands, and it calculates um, the, the shell, the roofing for you. Um, but this design has to have a very intricate form to build it. So you have to have a whole like waffle, waffle style form that the bricks lay on top. So I thought, but what if we can use augmented reality where, where we can have bricks, um, I don't have the slide here, but if we can have a put augmented reality and the, it tells us where the next brick is going to be placed. Uh, we, so with a fast setting mortar such as gypsum, um, we could have the first layer of bricks being set without having a form. So this is where I'm heading with this. So now in the last two years, I started designing buildings, um, redesigning the earthship, uh, bringing in sacred geometry, um, uh, and of course, for cold climate. So here is uh, Larry McQuell, uh, cold climate by architecture, which can house a yurt on top or a geodesic greenhouse, has some cheap secondhand water tanks. So again, the way I design is something that can be very affordable uh, for a person because people right now are very tight on cash. You know, the economy is literally on its knees. And so we need to design buildings that are fully autonomous, that we are not connected to the grid, but at the same time, don't make a hole in our pocket. So here is one of the latest the buildings I did with a sauna in, in, in the center and a reactor of um, hemp uh, blocks or, or straw bale blocks on the outside. Obviously everything is waterproof, but in this reactor will be sewage and wood chips um, that will heat up pretty high as per Jean Payne's method from France who, who tested this, heating up the sauna space and um, um, having additional heat stored in the berm. So the back of the house is buried. So I'll be showing this design from different angles now, but basically the, the, the both tunnels, the, the difference between an airship and, and my designs is an airship dumps all of their heat out into atmosphere, you know, creating the suction convection engine. So through this blue tube, the cold air comes in through the back burial, and then it, uh, it goes through the house and then they dump it out. Instead of dumping it out, I want to take it through this tube. Let's see if we can find another drawing. I, can, I want to take it through the tube in the geodesic greenhouse, which is the highest point, and send it basically underneath the home and through all these pipes, um, heating up the back berm. So the, all, the, there is a burial behind all these um, pipes, but I want to create it passively. So without use of fans or at most one fan. So I've designed these solar tubes, which are basically reflectors like a torch in the back. And on the front is polycarbonate. They're of course in Vesica Pisces shape and they have a black six meter pipe that basically gonna create a draft, a lot of suction during summertime, pulling all the hot air through the berm and warming it up for six, seven months of the year. Because the problem we have in, 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 in Russia is that it's um, completely overcast for five months of the year. And, um, maybe Dan could confirm that there in Europe, a lot of parts are very overcast, you know, <laughs> for a few months of the year. So we don't have the luxury of uh, Taos, New Mexico climate. We're 60 degrees north. We are, the sun comes up at 11 o'clock, sets at four, and, and that whole time it's overcast. So we really want to rely on the sun during summertime to heat up a three, four meter wall behind the, the tires and, and, and this entire home. So the reason that I'm doing this is a house that can be fully um, or no additional heating during winter time because in Russia they're burning a lot of wood to heat up their homes. Of course, in Europe now there's gas, but gas has shortages. But you know you don't want to stay cold, and it was unpredictable weather. We want to have our homes keeping us warm and comfortable throughout the year. So I mean, these are just some pictures you're all aware of. How our forests are being destroyed. At, um, ridiculous rate. So really the, the, the reason I'm building this um, and the reason that I am using some metal in the roof is first of all, to stop the electromagnetic radiation from entering the space. Um, and the rest of the walls and floors obviously natural. And the second is because I don't want to use any wood in construction. Um, that's the overcast. The winters are really cold, minus 25, minus 30 Celsius. So the house that I'm designing is literally geared up for that. So here's some of the designs that I've 
done and the left one on the bottom which just have 70 percent completed i'll show you pictures from yesterday we just ran a, a three-week workshop in brazil so as you can see the top design here is what i've been building in russia i'll show you now but that uses by geometry 45 degree angle so basically the house generates a bg3 energy which is high harmonic of gold high harmonic of ultraviolet and negative green carrier wave uh, it's a whole lecture on its own, and um, Ibrahim Karim has invested 50 years into biogeometry. Uh, I highly recommend you, you, you look up, but basically he was able to stop electromagnetic radiation just through certain uh, shapes and turn the harmful effects of EMR into healing vibrations. Uh, so we're not stopping them, we're actually transferring them into healing vibrations or taking out the harmful vertical green wave, okay? Um, which most of man-made structures, uh, unfortunately, have. So here is another design of the... So as you can see, I'm using vesica pisces in my latest designs, um, just like on the one on the left uh, bottom here, also designed on vesica pisces, which is very much inspired by Dan Winter and all the work um, you have been doing. Um, just another drawing of all the pipe work. So there, from the greenhouse, I take it into a blue barrel, I'm sure you're aware of some of the uh, um, geothermal uh, heating systems. And basically it, it, warm, it takes the uh, warm air underneath the wetlands. These in greenhouses are the wetlands as per the Earthship tech. And then the septic here in the spiral is warmed up. And then all of that meets up in underneath the sauna space that you can climb in and, and maintain. And so everything meets there and then distributes through one fan everywhere else. And then once the solar chimneys kick in, then the fan stops. Um, I'm also taking hot air from underneath my floor because the sunlight will enter. I'll show you the side view now. The floor, so we don't want the floor to keep hot. So we'll tap, tap, be tapping that heat off and send it to the back berm as well. Um, the, the pipe uh, works. You can see. One, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Um, it's Valerie here. Um, I see the time is running is uh, one eight, and uh, there is a break at one ten. So it's up to you. Okay. You want okay. To I'm gonna I'm gonna run through quickly. So. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So these are some of the designs. This is what I built in Russia. It took me three months to dig out by hand. So it does take time. Natural building is very labor intensive. And then <clears throat> rainbows. I want to utilize. Uh, Peter Erickson's rainbow, large rainbow tech in the houses. So because I believe the houses need to be like temples. Um, dream catches in our homes, because if you're spending five months of the year in your home because of winter, you want to have climbing nets that you can climb throughout. And obviously this can create beautiful geometry and good resonance. The homes like a temple. So like uh, another thing I'm developing is a calendar, an interstellar calendar that you can um, be inside and, and look at when look at retrograde and that's a whole separate lecture uh, but basically a, a kaleidoscope that you can sit inside this onion thing but I want to show you the pictures these are some of my workshops that we've built um, that's in South Africa and this is a water tank so I love curves curves are natural and this is it this is what we finished yesterday in three weeks a vesica pisces sacred geometrical building obviously still needs a roof but here is an outdoor spiral shower, an acreage dome, and uh, a sandbag dome. It's mostly earth, only 9% cement. Um, very cool structure. So this is three weeks, about 10 of us. Uh, we're going at a full power, and then a wetland is going to be on the front. So that's the house on the left bottom. You can see the design, and you can see how it's all coming together. Um, that is fab fabulous. Fabulous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and this is, so the home has almost become Dan, your inspiration of uh, Vesica Pisces and sacred geometry, th this is it. This is, this is 15 years after I got introduced to your work. 15 years later, I'm starting to design buildings that are, that are practical and, um, you know, that utilize the water tech. Um, um, yeah, you, you know, and, you've, got, yeah. you've got implosion going on there. It's good. You've got mostly natural materials. You have high capacitance. It's very nice. It's gorgeous. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So that's it. Um, are there any questions? Yes, there are. Um, I, I, because we discussed uh, yesterday together, um, Alicia, you were talking about your um, situation mm -hmm. in Russia and how it's possible to have land very cheap and uh, even abandoned villages. But um, before, um, I would like to read the questions. Mm -hmm. What I wanted to 
from Rata is uh, materials used in cold and rainy uh, climate because I saw the buildings of Ran were mostly with bamboo. Uh, can we use bamboo in cold climate? Uh, does it need it a special grow, cold? It doesn't grow in cold climate. To keep it uh, for longer time. Uh, yeah, I, I think we just what you just said. Uh, I mean, if naturally it doesn't grow in cold, cold climates, we should use it. We should use something that is available in the surrounding environment. I think bamboo makes a lot of sense for tropical um, weather uh, conditions and that particular location where there is, uh, you know, you're going to be open structures. You don't need to think about heating and all of these uh, other concerns. Architecture reflects the environment, so you can't build with something that that is not in the environment itself and doesn't work with that environment specifically. And you need, to, you, uh, and you so, need to understand the nature of materials. So uh, while bamboo is great for tropical climate, like Juan said, um, we have to have a certain amount of mass because if you're living in an um, uninsulated environment, you have to be burning a lot of wood to keep yourself up at tw minus 25 Celsius to plus 25, yeah. you know, it's a 50 degree jump. So if we have, that's why those Russian stoves, the masonry stoves are so large because it goes through all the vents and when you fire that thing up once and it keeps you warm for two days. So, you know, we just need to understand what we're designing and where we're designing. That's where the permaculture comes in so uh, beautifully. We have yeah. um, a friend, Michael Rice, so uh, has been so uh, active in this field. Michael, you wanted to say something also? Yeah, Zana and I are here very much enjoying the presentation and uh, just would like to say a few things. Um, Alosha, fantastic presentation, Juan, Dan. Uh, what we particularly absolutely respect across the board is the application of real life experience and in service uh, to the next step, in service to what's going on. I mean, we are literally in kindergarten, all of us, you know, literally there's we have an alphabet awaiting us. We have A, B, and a little bit of C, if we're lucky. And uh, even if we were to get understanding of this vast unknown uh, alphabet waiting for discovery and waiting for, waiting for conscious integration, and then we can start to make sentences with the planet. Then we can start to uh, write poetry. And uh, the key would be to unlock the next. The key is beauty. We've been saying this, and but beauty beyond, uh, geometric rigidity, beauty beyond uh, some cultural notions, something that is emanating from the inside. And uh, it's difficult to define. It's my, by definition impossible to define because it's an emanation from, from the soul. It's a, it's, a, it's a language of the heart. And we can use all of these modalities and models, technologies and languages uh, as a pen, at best, mm -hmm. a pencil, let's say. And, uh, but the rest is, is, is really opening. And this is why we cannot, in our humble experience and, and opinion, we cannot divorce the necessity to, to establish uh, integrity within ourselves, clarity of thought and feeling and mind and emotion to clear the blocks, clear the presumptions, clear the so on. I know this is dangerously wishy-washy because it's heading into uh, the unknown, that's what we're inviting, but it's, it's absolutely a vital component if we're going to take this forward. And so uh, absolute multiple levels of hats off to you guys and girls for, um, for giving this voice, for giving this uh, an opportunity to be part of the, the conversation, and not just the conversation, but the symphony, not just the symphony, but the universal song. So we have this together and uh, very, very, very inspiring to, to see the application, the real world application of, and, and again, Alosha, we'd love to say to you and to everyone that the honesty uh, that you are uh, expressing, like when you said you burnt your fingers because uh, you did this huge amount of work and then realized you made a big mistake. Not many people would do that. So we want to, we want to say that that's how we learn by making mistakes and uh, understanding better. And I'm, I'm absolutely full of mistakes. I'm I've got a history of uh, trying something naively or overly enthusiastically and then seeing the result. And this is why I have got, and we have got to the point of realization 
that uh, there's more going on than just the application of materiality, shape and form. There's a hell of a lot more going on. And uh, in many, many of the structures, of the hundreds of structures that we have designed and, and, and seen built, uh, the reality is when you talk to the people uh, a year, five years, 10 years, 15 years later and see what has happened, that can't be ignored. And that has nothing to do with testing and has nothing to do with, with uh, measurement. This is the truth. And so if our architecture is not in service to the holistic expansion of consciousness, and the and the, the playfulness of what's calling then it is at best just a pretty space and that, that's really where we're, we need to take it so all of the conversations here are uh, part of the abc and uh, but let's let's keep talking let's keep sharing i would like to say something um like michael was saying about uh, the homes uh, i'd like to chime on that that most important is that we heal our trauma because you can be living in the most beautiful house if you have a burning sensation in your heart and throat it usually hears this and your legs are shaking and anxiety no sacred geometry or resonators are going to help you with any healing they will they will make you feel somewhat better but i, I believe we need to deal with our traumas uh, on, uh, and we, this is what we share on our youtube channel so please come and join and be part of the the, tr the truth that we need to open up a can of worms and look at our past and, and and deal with those situations so we can get our wings and you know fly forward um, and that's how we can build communities because a three-week workshop just showed me that I ain't ready to get into any community with anybody at the moment. Mm -hmm. and that's the truth. Until the, the people realize that I, we are traumatized and we do need healing. Because right now everybody's got the smile and I'm fine and it's perfect. And that's mm -hmm. not the case. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to add to what Michael was saying. It starts mm -hmm. in the inner work and very specific inner work. Yeah. That's what we share on our YouTube channel, which I posted here in chat. Your situation in oh, land is so, guys, land is so cheap. You can get a whole village, which there are 40,000 abandoned village, and every week there are more and more abandoned village. They have electricity, they have roads to them, and they have a, a for long forgotten food forest. Most of the houses have fallen. You can buy a home that's still in okay condition that will need some quite serious renovating, maybe five thousand, six thousand dollars at most, but you can buy a hectare of land with a home on it uh, yeah. for about $2,000 with wow. a thousand fruit trees yeah. around you and you will have it all to yourself. So I'm seeing communities where we're not joining like the picture behind me, 70 families on 110 hectares. I'm not seeing that. I'm seeing each family has their own piece of land and uh, the price of land in Russia really, really allows that. Um, and it is a, and it comes with fruit trees and homes and clean drinking water and electricity and you can have it all for two thousand dollars and and start building your life. So if you want to reach out, connect with me, and uh, we'll for, for form a forum that will assist you with um, paperwork and so on. So uh, I believe Russia is the last bit of freedom on earth with. Uh, no slave mentality like South Africa, like Philippines, like Brazil, and so on. So, and people can reconnect with uh, Michael Rice, and we can't thank enough Juan Schlosser, and they're all at bioarchitects.net. And we're going to be adding Alosha to that team and on that site also. So, there's lots of ways to reach everybody here. We'd love to stay in touch, and we're so grateful. And Juan, again, your con contribution to the science here is so wonderful. And, and Michael, he's the shaman of the crew. <laughs> and Alosha, he's the young energy that keeps us going. So thank you. And, and Valerie's the pure intention. So it's all good. <laughs> it has been wonderful to meet all of you. And we'll certainly go on all your website to see. It has been absolutely fantastic. I wasn't even imagining. I didn't know something was going to existing like that. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Blessings. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Dan. <laughs>